Thank you, Anatolis. Thank you very much for inviting us to speak for your group and to your group and also to, for for your invitation, you know, to publish with you in that 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 volume. Um, so shall we start, Wesley? Please do. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good. So uh, if you could just just uh, okay, this slide. That's perfect. Um, so uh, there are other authors to our to our paper. Uh, those three people you see here on the slide, apart from us, Janusz Hołys, Julian Sienkiewicz, and Krzysztof Suchewski are all big data scientists from the Department of Physics at Warsaw University of Technology in Poland. So each person in that team has a different expertise. So me and Wesley are more on uh, intelligence studies, crime science, and social studies and political science side of the, uh, uh, of the problem, but we will try to cover uh, those bits of our paper and um, and those areas and, and topics that might be interesting to you. And before we started today, we we've asked Anatoly about your uh, like regular backgrounds as a, as a as an audience. So since you are uh, data scientists and computer science ma uh, managers, maybe it will be interesting for you to you to to hear our our input from the point of view of intelligence studies and, and, and political science. Uh, so next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, all right, just so, so just to give you a general orientation of, uh, of why hybrid warfare in the scope or in the scheme of this, of this paper and what, what hybrid warfare is, um, uh, is about. So this is a, one of the warfare or military strategies. It's not a new invention by uh, by any, any means, but it's a it's a kind of a combination of different tactics and techniques used by the military in the irregular or asymmetric and 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 cyber uh, warfare. Its main main its main aim is to weaken and destabilize the the target population, the target country, the target state, without the perceived involvement. Uh, so, uh, while using those techniques, and we will address a couple of methods that are within that scheme of hybrid warfare, the country that utilizes that, that strategy can maintain more or less plausible uh, deniability to avoid retribution or, or to claim that they don't bear any responsibility for those uh, actions. One of the defining elements of hybrid warfare especially today is targeting the target population along societal uh, divides and we could see it very clearly during the, the the ongoing covid crisis since the very beginning of the crisis in the you know early early spring of of, of 2020 that the actors uh, that that uh, utilize the hybrid warfare strategies that me and wesley will be talking about uh, today uh, that they uh, leverage the the health crisis situation to to attack the targeted population along those those societal uh, divides and you know the ongoing health crisis you know COVID nineteen in this case but it it could happen in a, in any other type of health crisis uh, or natural disaster circumstance such a, such a crisis exacerbates the societal uh, divisions and becomes sort of a fertile ground for for uh, malign foreign influence for propaganda um, and disinformation and they all form a part of the hybrid or asymmetric warfare uh, arsenal uh, no next next please uh, so just a little bit about the uh, the terminology. You know, I'm 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 pretty sure that most of you or all of you understand the differences between those terms that are listed here on this on uh, on this slide. But uh, you would be surprised how often those terms are used interchangeably or considered to be uh, synonyms, not only by like general public or or by the journalists, by even but but even by the uh, by the experts. So they are not the same. They are not the synonyms. And within the vocabulary uh, related to the so-called infodemics, and I will cover that 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 in a moment. What this term is all about, 
uh, there is a there is a, a, a both an understanding and a need to create a unified uh, dictionary, so to speak, or or, or a unique unified vocabulary of terms related to the information overflow. So uh, the two terms that you will most frequently come across is disinformation and misinformation. What distinguishes two of them is the uh, falseness of the information, but, but also the intention or the lack of intention to cause harm by uh, or while broadcasting or propagating them. So in the case of disinformation, the information that you come across is false, but the person who is behind that and who is responsible for sharing that has a direct intention to cause harm. So they are doing that for malign or bad or evil reasons. In the case of misinformation, this, the, the, the news or the information or the piece of the, of the news that is shared is also false, but the person who is sharing that genuinely believes what, that what they do uh, is benign, that they are not doing that to harm uh, anybody. They, they, they honestly believe that information themselves and they want to share that with, with, with people around them or they, in their social networks or, uh, or in their family or friends groups just, uh, just for, 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 good, for good reasons. Although the information is false, they just don't have an understanding of that, they are not aware of that uh, and they, they share it thus um, um, uh, like extending the spread of, of, of such news. And there is, there's finally the third, the third term called malinformation, uh, which is like least frequently spoken of, where the information is actually accurate or genuine, but the intention behind sharing that is wrong or is evil. So it's intended to cause uh, harm. And one thing, apart from that vocabulary that is listed here, is that uh, you need to be aware that in the in the environment or circles of, of the infodemic managers or and, and people who study this information, especially recently, there is uh, there is a, that that uh, understanding that the popular term of of uh, of the so-called fake news should be rejected. So we don't use that term. So we are not saying about you know fake news propagation. So we're we're talking about disinformation or misinformation, not about the fake news, because we believe that uh, it was abused or, or, or used to, uh, to especially by, for political reasons, to discredit the, the, the media, especially by, uh, by, by politicians. Uh, next, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so all of those, those methods that I, that I mentioned or described a moment ago fall into that general umbrella of the of the so-called infodemics. This term is not new, so it was not designed during the COVID crisis. Actually, it was coined by, uh, by David Rothkopf many years ago in 2003, during the original SARS um, pandemic to describe or, or, uh, or call the, uh, the phenomenon of the, of the information overflow. When, when the general public were confronted by the, by the immense and unprecedented amount of information, both real and not, both accurate or true and false, um, uh, and, and, so, and so on. Um, so the, the uh, infodemics, the term of infodemics is related to that, to that phenomenon and it's been frequently used ever since, but especially uh, uh, it found like sort of like a, a renaissance. We can hear about the renaissance of that term during the ongoing um, uh, COVID crisis. So, um, what disinformation and misinformation causes is the increase of uh, of emotions such as fear or anxiety or insecurity or lack of trust among the among the public among the among the audience that that is targeted by that. Uh, information and what's even more dangerous in especially in the context of hybrid warfare is that this audience is much more prone or sus susceptible uh, to, uh, to, ma to manipulation which makes it both a perfect target of disinformation campaigns and also a tool or a vehicle that will or would broadcast 
uh, that information even further. So next slide, please. And I think I would give floor to Wesley at this moment. I think you muted. I think you, your phone, uh, your microphone is muted. How is that? Can you hear me now? Perfect. Ah, uh, sorry about that. I'm getting used to the controls on this. Um, okay, let's talk about the uh, some of the sources of disinformation and misinformation. Um, I did a search a few minutes ago on the wiki um, to find some of the most prolonged conspiracy theories, and um, some of these I think everyone's heard them, but it's kind of interesting that these have um, survived so long. Uh, one of them is that 9-11 is a hoax or it's a uh, cover-up for something else. Um, of course, they continue to talk about Area 51 and aliens. Uh, the moon landing back in 1969 and subsequent ones were fake. Another, um, another conspiracy theory, and of course, the, uh, there was a movie about that. Um, uh, there's a more conspiracy theories that the Holocaust, Holocaust was uh, didn't happen. So these things have endured for quite a while. Um, the things that are happening today, though, are, are, are really quite infra interesting. Um, and one of the things that um, has come up in conversation is why are conspiracy theories um, so prevalent? And I tend to think it's because conspiracy theories are easier to understand than science. And of course, all of you know that science is a process of hypothesizing and proving or disproving a hypothesis. And it, science has been called a, a slow stumble towards less uncertainty. Conspiracy theories, on the other hand, string together often unrelated facts, and they're kind of easier to understand than we don't understand things and we only slowly learn through science. So what's happening or where where is disinformation, misinformation coming from today? Well. Let's take a look at the uh, anti-vaccination movement. At least in the United States, there are 12 people that are responsible for about two thirds of the anti-vaccination misinformation. These are people that have businesses that benefit from um, this anti-vaccination movement. And in many cases, they generate millions of dollars a year for these businesses. Some of the, some of the points of misinformation include 5G causes COVID, uh, vaccines make you sterile. Uh, vaccines make you magnetic. Uh, uh, the vaccines are a plot by Bill Gates to inject everyone in the world with microchips. And I know these sound ridiculous, but many of these have gotten traction. And I know in the United States and some other countries, we have, you know, 10 or 20 or even 30 percent of the people that um, distrust vaccines to the extent that um, they're reluctant or even unwilling to get a vaccination. And of course, this is filling our hospitals here in the United States and continues to uh, add to the death toll. Um, another source is political discourse. We'll talk more about that. And then finally, interstate competition, which is really the, the, uh, the essence of what I wanted to talk about. Next slide, please. Okay, motivations are important. Um, and I'll take a look at three different ones. First, Russia and its predecessor, the Soviet Union, have had a long adversarial relationship with the United States and its Western allies. China, um, in its quest to become the predominant state power, has utilized all capabilities to advance um, its economic advantages. And then finally, and uh, this echoes around the world, in the United States, Many aspects of the pandemic have become politicized, often as weapons between the major political parties or measured to both contain the virus and the vaccinations to fight against it. And these, um, these, this, uh, these positions reverberate around the world um, to this day. Next slide, please. Russia has maintained a long-standing effort to undermine the legitimacy of Western democracy. This was brought out by a, a report by the Director of National Intelligence this past April. Uh, the Mueller report noted also that 
Russia intends to undermine all Western liberal democratic societies. Russia's use of a health crisis to undermine or to further its political agenda is not new. Back in the 1980s, Operation Infection was launched by the Soviet intelligence and disseminated disinformation that HIV AIDS was developed by the United States as a biological weapon um, in Fort Detrick, Maryland. This reverberated also around the world, um, uh, particularly in, um, in Africa, where the story was that AIDS was developed by the United States um, as a weapon against the black population. And in fact, as recently as um, the late 1990s, surveys in the United States and the black population uh, uncovered that many people still believed um, that HIV AIDS was developed uh, to suppress the black population. Um, not surprising since this builds on, it was very clever for the uh, Soviets to do this. It builds on the Tuskegee um, experiments where uh, blacks in Alabama were deliberately um, uh, give, given disease to study the effects of disease. Rush has also echoed Chinese claims that COVID-19 was developed and spread by the United States as a weapon against China. Uh, Russian trolls, excuse me a second, Russian trolls have amplified this disinformation to exacerbate the American debate on vaccines and to continue to undermine American politics. As recently as two days ago, the New York, the New York Times uh, cited a New York City vaccination information center that uh, determined that uh, disinformation was coming out of St. Petersburg and the, and the Internet Research Agency. So Russia has, Russia devotes extraordinary resources to a political information war uh, to destroy Western democracies. And the pursuing investments, as Casper said, in high impact, low cost, asymmetric warfare to correct the imbalance between Russia and the West. Next slide, please. As we talked about, China aspires to be the leading economic, military, and political player in the world and wants to surpass the United States and the West in all aspects of national power um, by 2035. By national power, we're talking about diplomacy, information, military, and economics. You may have heard of the acronym DIME, which is for national power. Um, there's, a, there's a plan called Made in China 2025 um, to upgrade Chinese industries, especially in advanced fields such as robotics, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. Um, you may have heard just a few days ago a U.S. general saying that China has surpassed the United States in artificial intelligence. Um, China's ability, however, to reach this goal must be questioned, and this may lead to even more aggressive efforts to acquire advanced technologies. Uh, China does use a network of related media organizations to propagate misinformation, and it echoes um, this disinformation on issues including voter fraud, COVID-19, and various QAnon theories. Um, China does say that they want to catch up with mRNA technology. I think most of you know that the um, Chinese developed vaccinations are based on old technology. Um, they want to catch up on mRNA technology. And in fact, there was an attempt in 2020 to steal the technology from the pharmaceutical firm Moderna. Next slide, please. In the United States, um, in its politically polarized society, news outlets, fringe media, conspiracy sites, some with significant reach mislead their audiences with false narratives and with and resulting significant negative outcomes. Um, some interesting things about that, political party correlated with specific beliefs about protection from infection and the effectiveness of uh, vaccinations. Um, people that looked at conservative media uh, also correlated with belief in conspiracy theories. And then Two thirds of the U.S. population overrated their belief that they could tell what was misinformation, and were overconfident. Um, and those were the people most likely to spread the misinformation. So the U.S. information chaos related to COVID-19 um, that we also had here the 5G communications conspiracy theory, and then multiple QAnon community claims about the virus. 
um, and about political actions here in the United States. Now, the, um, in the United States, uh, this information was coming from both official and unofficial sources, um, and potentially it affects worldwide the perceptions about COVID-19 and the vaccinations. Um, about a third of English language COVID-19 misinformation were news re media reports of statements by then U.S. President Donald Trump. Um, other prominent political figures, including politicians and celebrities, account for 20% of the misinformation. However, uh, these individual, individuals account for about 69% of the information that gets echoed on social media. Um, next slide, please. Now, Casper and I looked at artificial intelligence uh, as a way to counter misinformation. And what we found is that artificial intelligence um, really is a double-edged sword. It can be used to counter misinformation, but also can be used to generate misinformation. So um, yes, we think it has a tremendous amount of potential for countering what we're seeing. At the same time, we urge caution um, in using that. Next slide, please. Uh, two artificial intelligence approaches that we looked at. The first were generative adversarial networks. Now, uh, general adversarial networks are um, a bifurcated effort, if you will. First is the uh, generative network. And this is a, um, a way to generate um, narrative about a certain topic. And on the other side, um, there is a discriminative discriminative <laughs> discriminative network that tests out the generative uh, network generated text. So you have the text being generated uh, on one side and then the test happening on the other. And what we're trying to what's been trying to achieve is um, text that uh, is accepted by the discriminating network more than 50% of the time. In other words, it looks truthful most of the time. And at that point, um, the AI approach can be used to generate misinformation because it looks like it was generated by a human being. The second approach are large language models. And these are models that you use a huge amount of um, text and other information to learn from and uh, generate uh, both messages and responses. I think all of us have experience dealing with uh, these computerized uh, telephone answering systems that want you to ask your question. They ask another question. They sort of eventually get you to the right place. These are um, uh, large language models and used in a business sense. So we've had expert, we've all had experience with them. We've also seen um, on the first model, most of us have seen pictures generated by these AI approaches where it's extremely difficult to determine what is an actual picture and I hate to use the word fake, but how about a manufactured picture too? So it's getting to the point where these AI approaches can deceive us, but also remember they can be used um, to, support, to discriminate um, the false information from to our true information. Um, from here, I'll turn it over to Casper. All right, thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Uh, so, in our paper, uh, we cover different approaches to using the so-called, using the old school term, computerized methods of addressing the problem of disinformation or misinformation, how we can utilize those tools to, uh, to facilitate the early detection uh, or the, of, of disinformation or distinguishing uh, true and false uh, narratives. So one of those methods are the so-called knowledge graphs, uh, which are. Um, am I am I okay? Okay, because you know the the, the I'm I'm like on a really unstable connection. I'm really sorry about that. So it's mostly to build. Uh, it's it's designed to build a content-based uh, detectors. You know the biggest problem with that is it's that it's very time-consuming and especially. The, from my point of view, the, the, the massive problem is that it's retroactive. So it bases mostly or relies mostly or primarily on the so-called fact-checking sites. 
so it doesn't detect the information by itself. It just relies on the, on the databases of, of information that somebody, usually humans, rate to be either true or false. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with the fact-checking sites. There are plenty of organizations worldwide. Some of them are very well established. Some of them are linked to the governments of specific countries or to the... To the East Stratcom that deals with those kinds of, um, of problems, but it's all done uh, manually. So those systems that are designed based on that uh, and are, are using knowledge graphs are, are heavily relying on the on actually on the databases that somebody else has, has created. Another approach that we cover is the social response approach. Uh, in that approach, we we try to assess, or the systems try to, or the algorithms try to assess how users, specific users of, let's say, the social media or the news audience, how they react to the specific post. What are their responses and reactions to the to the material or the information being uh, being posted? So the systems or the algorithms assess the correlation between the reactions of the users and the truthness. Uh, to truthfulness or falseness of the of the of the information. Then we've got the so-called hybrid approach, which combines the social response of the users with their characteristics. With, I mean, with the users' characteristics. Uh, so each user, for example, gets the so-called suspiciousness score, so to speak, based on their interaction with the system or with the uh, uh, information system that they are dealing with. And then the information itself, uh, itself is then rated by the so-called suspiciousness score, which is the sum of the score given to the users interacting with it. And then we've got the graph approach, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that this audience is very, very familiar with that, uh, where we study or the algorithms study how the information spreads across the network. Uh, so the, the, the basic assumption is that the false information spreads or is propagated in a different way with different pathways and different interactions in the meantime to the genuine information. And finally, what we, de what we describe uh, is, is another approach called, called the multimodal approach, which incorporates uh, the information from multiple modalities uh, to build better and more efficient um, predictive models. The, the simplest form of that would be the combination of visual and textual uh, information. But you know, our, our, our stance is that only through the combination of, of all of the above, of, of all of those uh, techniques, we can try to detect the malicious uh, behavior early to understand its its impact on the audience or on the society in general and counterbalance or counteract uh, such such actions uh, uh, next please so so this is one of uh, just just an just an illustration of the of the problem that we are de we're dealing with if we investigate different types of uh, of social media uh, that are used or can be used to broadcast or, 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 or spread disinformation and misinformation. Correct me if I'm wrong, Anatoly, but I think one of the very first seminars uh, in this series this fall addressed the differences between the Twitter and Facebook environment. Uh, so, um, so what, no, you know, the graphs like that are, are just used to, to illustrate how links between agents or the users are, are are formed, and what are the vectors of of the internet of the interaction between the the nodes or the agents or the users? If it's unidirectional or bidirectional, if there is any, any interaction between the original poster and the and the audience, and 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 vice versa. Uh, ne next, please. Uh, and finally, uh, what we would like to you know to 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 to, to talk about today, and um, uh, what we cover in, in the paper is the is the the modeling the uh, approach to, that that we use to understand the potential potential threats 
associated with disinformation and and mis misinformation, especially like the ones that we are dealing with now during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So first of all, we need to understand how links between social agents are formed. So which of those links emerge naturally because of the regular human-like interaction and discussion and which are which of those uh, those links are most likely to be engineered by by malicious actors so this is like primarily with the uh, injection of, uh, of of information uh, generated or broadcasted by for example bot networks the second thing is to the need to study and to model how misinformation and disinformation spreads in the network. So we're talking about the vectors of, of propagation. So uh, the modeling would allow us to, to assess and analyze the speed of spread. And we could, we could assess if we can actually, if, if, if the speed of the spread of information, be it misinformation or, or disinformation, can it be predicted? And can it be at some stage influenced, including the identification of social agents that are most likely to help that uh, false or, or malicious information uh, to spread across the network. And finally, modeling helps us to understand how the access to information, just sheer access to, to, to the news, to the piece of news or, 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 um, uh, or, or a post that, that that's 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 shared how the access to that influences the the opinions of social agents the users of the uh, uh, in, in the network and also how malicious agents can shape the sources of information or timing of the information propagation or the dynamics of how it spreads and how they utilize that to maximize the effectiveness of, of the malicious or adversarial campaigns. Uh, next, please. So this is the, the final slide be, before we thank you and move to the Q&A session. So this is the list for those of you who would be interested more in, a, uh, in the intelligence studies or crime science or political science approach to those problems since most of you or this is my my educated guess are from the computer science um, um, sector uh, maybe you would be not, uh, interested in, in in having a look at at a slightly different angle uh, uh, of, of of research and 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 analysis related to those to those problems so uh, I understand that this this um, uh, presentation is recorded and then it will, will be shared with you uh, on the Ryerson website. So those of you who are interested uh, might have a look uh, at some of those publications and we, we would both be really happy to hear some feedback from you because it would definitely help us a lot. So uh, next, please. And I will give the floor to the studio. <laughs> Thank you.